Okay, welcome back to uh, chapter three notes. And so <clears throat> we ended last last uh, lecture video by talking about the T accounts with reference to our RIP and finished goods and cost goods sold. So now let's talk about cost flows in terms of process costing. So you can see up here, the cost flows, it's a process, it's a system of averages. So we're going to have to calculate this. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time going through and how to, how to calculate an average. Now we know at a pretty high level how to calculate an average, right? If I, if I said you go to Walmart and you spend $100, $100 buying 10 t-shirts, on average, how much did you pay per t-shirt? When you take 100 divided by 10, you get 10. You pay $10 on average. So how did you do that? You took total cost divided by total units, and that gives you the average, okay? So we're going to do something similar, but when I talk about total cost, I'm going to have to be a little bit more specific. When I talk about total units, I'm going to have to be a little bit more specific, okay? So let's go ahead and continue. Um, what we're going to do, as I said over here, we're going to calculate the average cost by dividing the total production cost by the total number of units, okay? Um, and then when we complete the units, we're going to multiply that average unit cost times the number of units completed, and that's what's going to go from with the finished goods. And when we sell them, we're going to multiply the average cost and we'll have to calculate it again. We'll, we'll multiply the average cost times the cost per unit. We'll move it from finished goods to cost goods sold. And as I said earlier, uh, the sum of all the WIP accounts equals the total WIP for the entire company. So you look over here. So this is just kind of a, a little example that we'll do kind of quickly. And then we're going to jump into calculating now uh, the, how do we figure out the number of units completed. Okay. Uh, so we say our Kent Chemical makes wood preservatives, which would be an example of the process costing uh, system, and two departments, mixing and packaging. Suppose Kent Chemical has the following cost for April. Direct materials, 142. Direct labor, uh, 62.2 for mixing. At the beginning of the year, the mixing department estimates it will incur 2,160,000 in overhead, 720 in direct labor. Kent allocates overhead on the basis of direct labor. Further suppose during the uh, during the month of April, the mixing department completes units, cost of three hundred sixty thousand dollars, and then they're transferred from mixing to packaging. So, if we look at over here with our T accounts, we can say we have our WIP, uh, WIP mixing. Remember, we had our one forty two that goes on the debit side because it's an asset, and then we have our sixty two two that represents our materials and then our labor. So then the last thing that we're missing is our overhead. We also have to allocate overhead to WIP mixing. And so first we have to calculate how much overhead will be applied. So the way we do that, right, is what we saw back in Chapter 2. We take estimated overhead divided by estimated allocation basis, 3,160, divided by our 720, gives us 3. $3 of overhead for every direct labor dollar. That's what this is telling you. So they had 62.2 in direct labor dollars, which gives us our 186.6. That's how much will be applied. Okay? Then we come over here, and then it says, so you can see the way we apply, what way we calculate overhead, and the way we apply overhead is just like what we did in job order costing, debit wit debit WIP, credit manufacturing overhead, and the way to figure out how much it is, estimated overhead divided by estimated allocation base gives you the predetermined overhead rate times the amount of um, allocation base actually used gives you how much overhead is applied. Okay? So we say the last thing we need to think about is during the month of April, the mixing department completes units with a cost of 360. Let's show that in terms of our T accounts. It's completed in WIP mixing and moved to WIP packaging. So I will credit with mixing because I'm moving it out of one asset account to the next asset account. Okay. This, that is a transferred in cost. Transferred from with mixing, transferred into with packaging. Okay. So now what we can do is we can do our journal entries. Write that chemical right over here. You can say, um, let's say our direct materials, we debit whip for our 142, and we credited raw materials for our 142. With our direct labor, we debit WIP for the 62.2, and then we would credit wages payable 
for the 62.2 with our manufacturing overhead. Um, our manufacturing overhead, we would debit WIP for that 186.6. We credit manufacturing overhead just like that. And then with finally with our last um, journal entry is to recognize that transferred in cost. We would debit with mixing and credit, um, I'm sorry, debit with packaging and credit with mixing. Okay, so it's our $360,000 right over there. Okay, those are our T accounts to recognize, uh, I'm sorry, these are our journal entries to recognize those transactions we just showed in the T account. All right, so what I have over here is a kind of a, a summary of the journal entries and pretty much the, la the only one I don't didn't show you just right there was when it's if this were with packaging we're the last processing department and from with packaging it moves to finished goods we would debit finished goods and credit with packaging and this of course would be our cost of goods manufactured and then when we sold it we would debit cost of goods sold and credit finished goods, okay? So, like I was saying earlier, we have to calculate the average unit cost. We have to calculate the average cost, and we can do that because we're dealing with very similar or identical products, okay? So it makes sense to calculate the average. It wouldn't make sense to do that with an antique furniture restore or custom cabin shop, cabinet shop or an automobile repair shop because those costs are so different. But if we're talking about different types of soap or, or wood preservatives, where they're all pretty similar products, we can calculate the average. Okay, so when we when we do that, we have to figure out. Remember, the way we're going to calculate the average is by taking the total production cost divided by the total units. Okay, um, in the denominator, the total units. Okay, we have to figure out how many units do we complete which is going to be given to us. We can figure that out. But then we also need to include in the denominator the number of equivalent full units in ending work in process. Okay? We need to figure out the number of equivalent full units in ending work in process. Okay? So if we look over here, I'm looking on the next page, this is my denominator for calculating my average cost per unit which is going to be equal to the units transferred to the next department, which are those units that have been finished, plus the equivalent full units in ending work and process. So that's what I want to focus on right now. Okay. So if we say it over here, let's say we have 100 units in ending work and process, and they are 60% complete. That means we have a 60 equivalent full units. Okay. I just multiply the number of units times the percentage complete, and that gives me the equivalent number of full units. What I say over here is if materials are added when production begins and the 1,000 units in ending whip are 40% complete, then, typo, the equivalent units are calculated as follows. Direct materials, 100% complete, 1,000 conversion costs, remember that's our direct labor, plus our overhead is 40% complete, that gives us the 400. Now, why is it that we have to do these two separately? This is where it starts to get kind of tricky. Some of the calculations for the average cost per unit in Chapter 3, process costing, can be computationally intensive. Okay? So it takes some practice. We need to do these separately because we, they can be different percent completes. Why can they be different percent completes? Right, Direct materials is 100. Conversion, late, which is labor and overhead, is only 40%. It's because they can enter the production process at different times. So if you were to think about uh, making lemonade at home. You pour the mix into the water, and let's say at that point I say stop. You have put in all the lemonade mix and all the water. Your materials are 100% complete, but you have not mixed the lemonade yet. So you're zero, or maybe because you put the water in there, we'll say you're 25% complete with respect to labor and overhead. So they can add, they can Materials and conversion costs could be added at different points in the production process, and because of that, we can have different percent completes. What that naturally means is that the, the denominator for calculating the average cost per unit can be different for materials and for conversion costs, 
which then means we have to calculate the average cost per unit separately with respect to materials, labor, and overhead. Okay? And then what we can do is sum up the, um, that's what I was saying over here, is calculated for each component, materials, labor, and overhead. And then what we would say is, here's the average cost with respect to materials. Here's the average cost with respect to labor. And then overhead, we would add up all three, and then we would get the total average cost for you. Okay? So if we look at our example right over here with our McMillan Tire Company. McMillan Tire Company produces uh, tires used on small trailers. The month of June ended with 300 tires in process. This is, these are, this is how many tires are in ending whip. Those 300 tires in ending whip are 85% complete with respect to materials, 50% complete with respect to conversion, which is labor and overhead. 2,500 tires were transferred to finished goods. This is how many tires were finished. Because when, when it's done, right, it's, it's going to move, it's going to move out of whip into finished goods. So whenever you see this, we're transferred to finished goods. That means those were completed, okay? And 2,300 tires were started during the month. The beginning whip was 65% complete with respect to materials and 45% uh, complete with respect to conversion. So what we want to do is we want to calculate this number, this number for conversion and for materials. So I'll do it separately for materials. I'll do it first for materials, sorry. sorry. So you say over here, units transferred to the next department. How many units were transferred? 2,500. Plus equivalent full units in ending whip. How many units are in ending whip, whip with respect to materials? 300. And then they are 85% complete with respect to materials. So then I'd say 300 times 0.85. Okay. Which then gives us when you add them together, 2,755. This is the equivalent units of production, which is going to be used in calculating the average cost per unit for materials. Let's do the same thing for conversion. We said the 2,500 plus, in this case, we have the 300 units, and they are 50% complete times 0.5, which gives us our 2,650. This is the denominator. This is this number. That's what this is. 2650 for conversion. Uh, that is the denominator to be used for calculating the average cost per unit with respect to conversion. Okay? So I'm going to end this lecture video here. And then on the next one, we're going to talk about how to calculate the cost per unit and uh, do some practice with that. Thanks.